Today's broadcast is brought to you by viewers like you. Become a member today and unlock exclusive content at patreon.com slash northstarradio. Alright, here we go. The year is 2020. Um, I don't really know what I'm gonna say. I usually script, like, script, 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 write lots of things on the internet. But no, I just press record, so... Um, There's this guy named Johnny Harris, and he's just announced his departure from Vox. Borders USA is cancelled and will not air. You see, for the past three years or so, Johnny Harris has been creating one of the most popular documentary series on YouTube, going by the name Borders. In this series, Johnny Harris would travel all over the world to discuss some of the most fascinating geopolitical conflicts of our time. But after leaving Vox, Johnny Harris didn't stop there. In fact, he propelled even further. Okay, so, number one, I'm gonna keep making YouTube videos. I'm now officially like a full-on YouTuber. This will start to really take a lot more priority in my life. Ever since the end of 2020, Johnny Harris has become the king of New Age journalism on YouTube. Video after video, Harris has a unique ability to bewilder and perplex his 5 million subscriber audience. Thanks in large part to his beautifully entertaining editing style, seamless way with words, and incredible ability to rewrite history, Johnny Harris has become a household name. Oh my god, that's Johnny Harris. Oh my god, he stole Johnny Harris's flow. Bro, Johnny Harris needs to sue him. While Johnny Harris has had his fair share of bad takes, resulting in endless criticism from YouTube commentators and normies alike, this time around, he may have outdone himself. In his latest video titled How the FBI Was Involved in MLK's Murder, Johnny Harris may have officially proven his willful ignorance. Johnny Harris has a history of getting things wrong. Or if I'm being charitable, fudging some numbers, simplifying some events, and making very broad claims to justify his worldview. A few years ago, Tom Nicholas made a video about Johnny's partnership with the World Economic Forum. Shortly thereafter, the present past made a video criticizing Johnny's rewriting of history when it comes to Western expansion and control of the entire world. And more recently, a channel by the name of North Star Radio made a video discussing Johnny's weak analysis and absolute glaze job of Joe Rogan. Johnny Harris, in all honesty, is very confusing to me because most of his videos are really good and while the conclusions he comes to in most of his videos are pretty uninspiring he does shine a light on many important issues with imperialist expansion he's made videos very critical of the Iraq war he criticized the immense power politicians wield on the stock market he's even made a handful of videos analyzing the destructiveness of colonial expansion but even after all that he goes ahead and makes a video defending America's greatest war criminal Henry Kissinger. I mean, listen, it was the Cold War. Like, again, none oh, of us can God. really capture what that was like. You had oh, come on, dude. Oh, oh he's just... Recently, at least in the past few months or so, Johnny Harris has been expanding his operation, hiring several writers, editors, and even a music composer. And for whatever reason, after enacting these changes in his operation, Johnny Harris' videos have gotten weird. War used to be simpler. Violent, yes, always violent, but more straightforward. It used to be about large groups of men fighting with their muscles. Johnny Harris has always been a dramatic storyteller. But in recent months, he's began experimenting with a lot of dramatization. He'll be tossing around papers and showing himself reading and highlighting books like he's really doing the dirty work. So invested in discovering the truth, bringing people to the edge of their seat, waiting to hear what secrets Johnny Harris is unfolding. This brings me to another critique of his journalism. Johnny Harris loves making incredibly obvious discoveries. He'll have some dramatic shots of him writing a script or reading a book, and at the end of it, He'll say something incredibly obvious, but he'll say it in a way where he's making the most big brain discovery that no one's ever heard before. And this is a key moment. The Prince of Wales says that he actually is not authorized to give the King of Persia any of these guns because they belong to Hiram Maxim's corporation. Pause here for a second. Do you see how this works back in the late 1800s and early 1900s? Governments couldn't sell weapons. It was the corporations that sold the weapons. They were the ones who were in charge. It was a free market of weapons. And the weapons kept flowing to everyone on Earth 
and these guys kept on making a lot of money. He basically will like explain a story as though he's the first to have ever come across this piece of information that's like prior. That I think is part of what makes it like kind of cringe. I think this is what really limits Johnny Harris's videos. He makes an incredibly surface level analysis of the topic at hand, but to him it's super in-depth and well-researched. So he doesn't think he has to go any further in said analysis, ultimately missing the much more meaningful conclusion. I honestly can't tell if he does this on purpose. Is he routinely leaving out key aspects of the story to deceive his audience? Or is this an example of willful ignorance, where Johnny Harris doesn't want to take extra steps steps in his analysis, in fear of said analysis shattering his entire global perspective. The Johnny Harris video I feel really illustrates this point is his latest video about Martin Luther King Jr. Now I am not an expert by any means in the work of Martin Luther King Jr. However I did make a video about the man a couple months ago where I did my own research on the topic and I feel as though Johnny Harris got many points wrong in this video ultimately coming to a conclusion tainted in his own faulty journalism. So let's have a look at some of the interesting things Johnny Harris had to say about Martin Luther King Jr. It's 1964, and a package has just been sent to Martin Luther King Jr.'s house in Atlanta, Georgia. The package contains reels of tape, and on that tape, there's blackmail, as well as this one-page letter. The letter is written in the voice of one of King's supporters. It's riddled with typos and corrections. And the letter tells King that he should, quote, look into his heart because he is, quote, a complete fraud, a great liability to black people. The letter calls him a, quote, dissolute, abnormal, moral imbecile, abnormal animal, a beast. What incredible evilness. Satan could not do more. The letter tells King that his end is approaching and that he has just one thing left to do. And he knows what it is. He has 34 days in which to do it. This letter insinuating that Martin Luther King Jr. should end his own life was not sent by a disenchanted follower and it was not typical hate mail. This letter was sent by some of the most powerful men in the United States the top leaders of the FBI. Johnny Harris says three words throughout this entire video that make absolutely no sense. Whenever Harris is discussing the marches, protests, and sit-ins King was participating in and leading, Harris routinely states that King had the moral high ground. Lunch counters, restrooms, and drinking fountains were desegregated across Birmingham. And as King predicted, the spectacle of peaceful protesters being violently cracked down on spread across the country elevating the movement to an unambiguous moral high ground that couldn't be put down by force and arrests and violence by law enforcement. I absolutely agree. In 2024, everyone sees it that way. MLK was obviously in the right. But Johnny Harris does an incredibly bad job at illustrating just how much MLK was hated at the time even after his assassination. I don't have the exact statistic with me right now, but I believe it was somewhere around 60%, 60 to 70% of Americans disapproved of MLK. And that was after his assassination. Johnny Harris states that once the public saw the excessive violence the police were inflicting on the organizers, it was clear who was right and who was wrong. In 1960s America, nonviolence turned out to be an incredibly powerful tool for waging this struggle because it always resulted in the same thing, the inevitable crackdown of excessive violence by law enforcement and counter protesters. And when that was then covered and shown to the general population, it was so starkly clear who was right and who was wrong in the situation. No, it wasn't. At the time, it was not clear at all. People hated King and the Black Liberation Movement before the protests. And once the protesting started ramping up, people hated the movement even more. Just look at the 2020 protests in response to the murder of George Floyd. People hated Black Lives Matter before, but once people saw the destruction across the United States the protests had caused, obviously the result of escalations caused by police violence, people hated Black Lives Matter and the entire movement even more. I'm not sure who this man is that Harris decided to interview for this video, but he has some pretty weird takes throughout the entire video. He mentions how violence is an illusion and nothing came from attacking your oppressor. That the idea that you were going to bludgeon your enemies or destroy your enemies into uh, some form of solidarity where it wouldn't just be permanently armed camps, he thought was an illusion. 
persistent illusion that we constantly make that that's one of the objections about militarism that it's based on a fantasy now i'm not one to advocate for violence as i feel change is possible without it but throughout history in times of immense oppression Violence was the only possible way to find emancipation. Just look at pre-USSR Russia or colonial Cuba. The common man was so small in the grand scheme of things that the only way they could achieve justice was with violence. I've mentioned this before, but I had issues with the 2020 protests at the time. I didn't understand the phrase, no justice, no peace, because I was a major advocate for peace, no matter what. But now in 2024, I understand the meaning behind it. Justice cannot be achieved when there is one-sided violence from the police state. And in response to said violence, peace cannot continue. Action must occur in the form of organization, sometimes violent, in order to achieve justice. It has reached that level of importance. Okay, so Johnny Harris brings up this incredibly famous letter. King and many of these protesters were arrested. From jail, King wrote a letter about why he was leading these demonstrations in Birmingham. August 1963, letter from Birmingham jail. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And that now was their time, for they had, quote, waited for more than 340 years for their God-given constitutional rights. This is the only way to change what was the status quo in America, where vicious mobs like your mothers and fathers, hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters. And after trying many different ways of addressing this, nonviolent direct action would build creative tension in the society. It would dramatize these issues so that they could no longer be ignored. It's honestly hilarious that Johnny brought up this letter and ignored many key aspects of it because in this letter, King speaks quite poorly of people like Johnny Harris, the white moderate. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that black people's greatest stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Martin Luther King literally calls out Johnny Harris in this letter. Yet for whatever reason, Johnny's conclusion was to agree with King and support his message, even though it talks negatively of people with his exact worldview. There are many whites who are trying to solve the problem, but you never see them going under the label of liberals. That, that white person that you see calling himself a liberal is the most dangerous thing in the entire Western Hemisphere. He's the most deceitful. He's like a fox. And a fox is, almost, is always more dangerous in the forest than the wolf. You can see the wolf coming. You know what he's up to. But the fox will fool you. He comes at you with his mouth shaped in such a way that even though you see his teeth, you think he's smiling and taking for a friend. But Martin Luther King was challenging an old, entrenched system. And when you disrupt a system like that, you create enemies. Either you give the Negro his God-given rights and his freedom, or you face the fact of continual social disruption and social chaos. His enemies included those that you would imagine, like the Ku Klux Klan, whose leaders allied with local police in the South and who stated that killing MLK would eliminate all racial problems in the South. You also had pro-segregation groups like the White Citizens Council who tried to convince the federal government that King's growing movement had communist connections. But it wasn't just these overtly bigoted groups. His enemies also included business owners, real estate developers, landlords, employers, all of whom benefited from the status quo. Discrimination in hiring practices, housing, and mortgages. Then, of course, there was a whole bunch of lawmakers and governors, most of them from the South, almost all of them from the South. But among King's enemies was a Department of Justice agency that was powerful, whose job it was to protect Americans and to enforce the laws of the country. That is not at all the job of the FBI. The job of the FBI is to keep the American state safe 
not the American people. This just proves that Johnny is a big fan of our current order, but he just has a problem with specific individuals in the system that are making it bad. In this video, Johnny Harris tries extremely hard to end any and all speculation that King was tied to communism. But the way Johnny Harris talks about communism is like the most childish thing I've ever heard. So remember it's the 1960s, it's the Cold War, there's an obsession with finding communist sympathizers, anyone who is sympathetic to our big enemy, the Soviet Union. And the director of the FBI at the time was named J. Edgar Hoover. He would be the director of the FBI for like decades. So as King's movement grew, Hoover became suspicious that the movement wasn't a grassroots rising up for equality and racial justice, but rather a communist plot to sow division in American society. So Hoover and his agents cook up some thin evidence that tie Martin Luther King to communism, and they get approval from the attorney general to spy on King. But what they don't tell the attorney general is that they're not actually looking for communism. There is no communism here, and they know that. What they're looking for is whatever they can get to take him off his pedestal. This communism that Harris speaks of is really just socialist ideology, something that King was absolutely vocal about during his work for black liberation. But Johnny Harris absolutely does not want to concede on this point. And he almost makes it seem that if King was tied to communism, it'd be totally cool for the FBI and the entire country to hate him. Johnny mentions that the tapes the FBI received of various phone calls and audio from the King's residence would soon be released. And Johnny basically states that when these tapes come out in like 2027 or something, we can finally assess our view of MLK. Like somehow these tapes are gonna change our mind about MLK. So when I read these reports from agents who go out with the mandate to collect evidence that will knock Martin Luther King off of his pedestal, I have kind of a hard time trusting how they interpret it, especially when I'm not looking at the primary source. I'm looking at agent's interpretation of audio recordings. These aren't transcripts, these are summaries. They're not visual, they're audio. And to me, they're tainted with deep racist bias. As someone who seeks truth and looks for evidence, that's a problem. Now, in 2027, all of the tapes will be released. And at that point, we will have the opportunity to listen to those tapes and assess whether or not they change in any way our legacy and our view of Martin Luther King as an individual. I guarantee Johnny Harris already has a video in the works, or at least plans to make a video when these tapes release. And I would bet a lot of money on the fact that Johnny Harris is probably gonna do a complete 180 on MLK and say that he's done some very bad things and we should not praise him as much as we do. But that's just a prediction. History will absolve me. So it's 1964. The FBI has been spying on King's every move. They have all these reports of his adulterous behavior. And this is when Hoover's nightmare comes true. Martin Luther King Jr. is selected to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, the ultimate moral high ground. Hoover writes a letter to Sullivan saying, now is the time to act, to expose him. And it's just a couple days later when the FBI sends that package to King's house in Atlanta with the tapes filled with sexual blackmail and a letter insinuating that it was time for King to end his own life in the next 34 days. We know for certain that this letter came from the FBI. It's like not speculation. A copy of the letter was found in Sullivan's files, though he claims that it was planted there. But what we don't know is exactly what was on those tapes. The tapes were also sent to the media who didn't end up publishing them, but they also didn't expose the fact that the FBI was spying on Martin Luther King. It was a different media environment back then. No, it wasn't. It was not a different media environment back then. People hated Martin Luther King. Of course the media and general public is going to be okay with the tapping of his residence. He was deemed a threat against white Americans. Of course people supported this. The FBI launched an investigation, which led them to this man, James Earl Ray, a 40-year-old fugitive who had escaped from a Missouri prison in a bread truck a year earlier. Okay, I just need to mention something. The 60s 
were insane. Like that's all I can focus on while I watch this video. People were always dressing up really nicely. They were smoking all the time, even indoors. And you could just escape from prison in a bread truck and just walk around on the street like nothing happened. Okay, so the ultimate conclusion that Johnny Harris comes to in this video is that the FBI probably killed Martin Luther King Jr. Not because he was a threat to the system, but because he was a threat to J. Edgar Hoover. I think the real reason why people think that the government Martin Luther King is because in a sense they did. What I've shown you today, all of these FBI transcripts and evidence from the 60s, is rock solid proof of one thing. J. Edgar Hoover and his bureau of powerful unelected men wore their badges of justice and then used their power to threaten the life of Martin Luther King. They did so the moment they saw a black man getting too powerful and threatening the power that they relied on to keep themselves on top. Johnny Harris concludes that it's one man's fault. A group of men, the FBI, led by one man, J. Edgar Hoover, who is the sole person to blame for the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Hoover, not the entire system, which requires the weaning out of these radical figures for the continuation of Western capitalist control? No. J. Edgar Hoover himself. Johnny Harris clearly loves the imperialist capitalist system. It's his bread and butter. This one man in particular, who not only benefited from the system, but fought to continue its existence, just had a personal vendetta against King. Nothing more, nothing less. This is a very common analysis that liberals often participate in, and I see it more and more when talking about Israel. They are more or less in support of the apartheid. They just think it's being done too harshly. So instead of fighting against the system entirely, they find a name to latch onto and organize around that. Instead of wanting the end of apartheid, they simply want the end of Benjamin Netanyahu's political control. America has a funny way of whitewashing radical figures of the past. While King was hated back in the day, he's now marveled as this peace-loving figure who had a massive impact on America, even heavily talked about in schools, especially at a young age. But their actual opinions or actions are whitewashed and fed to the public in a more palatable way. To say, this guy was good, but only for these select reasons that we're deciding to teach you about. In an article for Counterpunch titled Sanitized Radicals, they write, Although rewritten by mainstream media and scholarship as a liberal mainly focused on segregation and voting rights, he grew significantly more radical over his too short career. Notably, at the time of his receipt of the Nobel Prize in 1964, he told the press, we feel we have much to learn from Scandinavia's democratic socialist tradition. More revealingly, while jailed in Selma, Alabama, King's words are recorded as, if we are going to achieve real equality, the United States will have to adopt a modified form of socialism. Whitewashing of historical radical figures is so powerful that even Johnny Harris agrees with the things Martin Luther King was saying and fighting for, even though the things he was saying were staunchly critical of Johnny Harris himself. He's just been so whitewashed, Johnny Harris doesn't want to explore that side of King's work, or simply doesn't even know about it. Even white radicals were whitewashed. The quote-unquote smartest man in history, Albert Einstein, was a socialist, but now he's known for just that being the smartest man in history. Johnny Harris is clearly at a turning point in his life. He's so close to getting it. I just think it's an obvious example of willful ignorance. Johnny Harris used to be a part of the Mormon church. He quite recently left the Mormon church, and I'm sure there was a lot of willful ignorance taking place before his departure. Willful ignorance is simply the act of avoiding contradictory evidence because you don't want your already held beliefs to be proven false. I'm sure in doing some research for this video, Johnny Harris may have stumbled across the things King said in his letter from Birmingham jail. But, in an attempt to not have his entire perspective of the world proven inaccurate, he decided to ignore it or simply lie to himself as a way to comfort his flawed beliefs. All I can say is, I absolutely cannot wait for the day Johnny Harris has some big breakthrough, likely similar to the one which caused him to leave the Mormon church, that would shatter his entire global perspective. Say goodbye to Johnny CIA and welcome in Kami Harris. Or maybe that's a bad idea. Maybe we don't need any more leftist commentators.
I have way too much competition as is. Thank you for watching North Star Radio. Peace and love and free Palestine. Thank you.